Welcome to Wadsworth History on Film, a program presented by the Wadsworth Area Historical Society and designed to record the oral history of Wadsworth for posterity. I'm Cesar Carino, and our guest today is Carl Harker. Carl, you've been around for a long time in Wadsworth. As a matter of fact, if I can remember your age, you've been in Wadsworth exactly, almost exactly, one half the number of years that Wadsworth has been on the map. As you know, we started in 1814, and you were born in 1906. Six. That was 92 years after Wadsworth was born, and you're almost 92 years old now. Is that correct, or almost 91? Almost 91. Well, that's close enough. That's close <clears throat> enough. Carl, you, um, you have been in Wadsworth all of those years, and probably everybody knows you, even in Barberton, where you taught for many years. But Tell us a little bit about Carl Harder, where you were born, and the house in which you were born, which I understand is still standing. And tell us a little bit about Wadsworth in the early, very, very early 1900s. Well, the house where I was born is right down the road from us here. On the high school property? On the, on the high, it was, this was all the farm on which I was born. What was the name of the farm, do you remember? <coughs> it was called the Falk Farm. The Falk Farm, right. Mm -hmm. it, because his wife was the, the woman who inherited this land. Now, was that harder related to you? Yes. Mm -hmm. That that harder. In the mid 1800s, three brothers left Philadelphia. Well, I should go back. The first harder family in this country came to Philadelphia from northern Ger from I should say southeastern Germany. Mm -hmm. Uh, Württemberg, not Wittenberg, but Württemberg. Württemberg. Württemberg, Germany. With the umlaut over the U. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> they were driven out, this family was driven out of, of Germany in the religious wars and got, it took them four years to work their way down the Rhine River. Every little fiefdom that they went through, they had to pay to get through. Oh my. And they had nothing with them, so they had to work. And it took them four years to work their way down the Rhine to the taking off place, Amsterdam, to head for Philadelphia. And in that trip down the, the Rhine, a, the mother had to work for a crippled son, which was quite interesting, and worked with, she worked for him to get their passage through the fiefdoms of land, and she had to work for passage for the ship to come bring them across the old sailing ship to bring them across to Philadelphia. And what year would that have been, approximately? That would have been, uh, well, it would have to be eight, when they arrived in Philadelphia, it was 18, or 1734. 1734. So when they arrived in Philadelphia, yes. And from there then, the family spread out, and Wadsworth, was the result of three brothers <clears throat> leaving Philadelphia. They got to Greensburg, Pennsylvania, to the Harder family of Nellie Harder, who used to have the paper here. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, she was related to you also? Oh, yes. yes. How was she related? To your father's sister? Well, uh, or sister in law? I can't tell you the exact pro progenitor problem mm -hmm. there, but it. Uh, the Harder family that was in Philadelphia then. They were the second generation to leave, or they were in Greensburg. They were the second generation to leave Philadelphia. <clears throat> and these three brothers got to, got to, jet to the Pennsylvania. Two of them married. The wives would not come until they got the cabins built. Mm -hmm. And they had the land on the south side of, of the, the, the road from Wadsworth toward Barbert, not to Western Star all that land on the south side. The south side, which is where the high school presently is, all the way down to where the car dealerships are? Yes. All the way all down through clear, there? Beyond that, clear down to Western Star. All the way to Western Star. All so the, we're talking about... They had that land there. The Cyberling families had the land w east, of east, of Star, east of that. East of that. So we're talking Star. essentially, Carl, then from probably Durling Drive, as we know Durling Drive today, all the way down to the Western, Medina County Line Road. Right. Right. Probably an area of over a thousand acres, wouldn't it oh, be? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh because yes. Because a square was 640 acres, That's right. and a square uh, is <clears throat> defined by Durling Drive, Silver Creek Road, 
Silvercrest Road, Silver Creek Road, and Broad Street, and that's 640, so they probably had two squares. That's right. They which would have been, been at uh, least that, yeah. Close to about 840, 50, 60 acres, somewhere in that area. Mm -hmm. And that was the owner, the, the harder land at that time. <clears throat> and then <coughs> they came and got the cabins built, and then the, the two families moved in to this area, and that's the start of Harder's in this area. And then what about the Falks? How do they become involved with this Fred being? Fred Falk married my great-great aunt. Okay, who... so then they called it the Falk Farm instead of the Harter Farm. That's right. I see. That's right. Now, tell us about the house in which you were born. I think we all probably know where it is, but if you could tell us exactly where it is and what it's like and what the history of it is, well, I think it would be very good. From the high school here, east, there are two houses on the south side of the old road to Barberton. And just beyond that is the house where I was born. It, was, it is now a stucco-covered brick house built of handmade brick. And the clay to make that brick came from the old Mills Farm, which now is an auto dealership there. Right. Uh, the Mills Farm was on the corner of Wilson Road and Broad Street, that great big white house, is That's it not? Right. And the... Um, uh, Tony Perry Chevrolet is across the street, and the Dodge people are right there on the corner. On the corner. So that's giving, and we're trying to get a, a focus of it, exactly where it is. The clay came from there, and they were handmade. Handmade and then they built brick. That, handmade brick, and then they built that house there, which described the outside of the house for us so we know exactly where it is. Which well, we it's, it's an oblong two-story house. When it was originally built, there was a fireplace on the east end and the west end, in the basement, the first floor, and the second floor. That wow. was the heat for the house. That was the heat for the house. That mm -hmm. was the heat for the house, where it was originally built. Yep. And the outside, the distinguishing <coughs> feature about the outside is that the, the, um, the ceiling, or rather the, the roof, seems to have steps on it. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, why right. did they do that? Was that uh, I have no idea. probably an easy way to do it? It was an easy way to do it, and probably it was just an architectural feature that was common in those days. And you were born in that house? I was born in that now, house. Now, let's, let's go from birth to the time that you first remember. What do you remember that whole area looking like? Uh, you didn't look across the street and see the Dairy Mart store. <laughs> well. And you didn't see the auto stores and the root beer stand. What did you see? The old farm all along the road from Barberton to Wadsworth, the old farm from the farmhouse into Wadsworth was an apple orchard. All apple orchard. All apple orchard. Along the road were maple trees. Maple which, trees which, along the road. Which, what was the road like, Carl? Well, it was a dirt road when I was a kid. A dirt up. road. And I can remember the first paving being laid there by Italian paving bricklayers when I was a little kid, about five years old. And where'd they come from? Where did they come yes. from? I have no idea. They were Italian, but I mean, were they living in Wadsworth? No. No, they, they, they were brought here to do that paving. They I were, see. They were specialists, I guess you would say. But I remember as a kid of about five years old, sitting in the front yard of that old brick house, watching them lay that brick. And it was laid one lane on one side for a mile or so, then they'd move over and lay it on the, lay a mile or so on the other side. Now, as I remember growing up, of course, I'm not 91 years old, but as, as I remember <clears throat> growing up, that was a brick road for years and years, and then was finally macadamized That's or right. whatever. Um, when it was a brick road in 19, what would you say, uh, 10 or so, when they start, first start it laying was, the brick? It would have been about 1911, as 1911. I remember sitting out there in that front yard watching them watching lay, them lay the brick. Now, when they laid those brick, um, was it a wider, uh, as wide a road as it is today? No, or it was, was just it? a one-lane brick oh, road. Oh, a one-lane brick road. And then the other side was still dirt. I see. And then they'd move over to the north side and lay another mile of brick, and then another mile on the south side. Now, how long do you think it might have taken them? I don't have any idea. I saw bricklayers do that in Italy, and they do it as fast as you can talk. Oh, yes. Yeah, they're very oh, fast yes. about it. They, they've been doing that for, for thousands of years, of course. They're known for, uh, for uh, road building. Now, what was on the north side of the road as you looked there? Right now, we have some beautiful homes, as you know. Then we have Hartman Road, which we used to call Gypsy Lane. That's right. 
And could you tell us, talking about Gypsy Lane, could you tell us why they called it Gypsy Lane? Do you remember that? The gypsies used to come through Wadsworth every summer, horse and wagon, and they would set up camp. That was the old Freed Farm. The Freed Farm, right, where Lawson or the uh, Dairy Mart store That's is now. Right. That, now, on the west side of, the, of, the, of what we call Gypsy Lane was the Bachman Farm. The Bachman Farm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And down on the Freed Farm, they set up camp down there and with their tents and their wagons and their horses. How many would come? There may be eight, 10, 12 wagons. And you remember this? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And what would they do? Well, <laughs> I can remember coming to the front door at the house. Two, two of them would come to the front door and rap and get somebody to come to the door. And if you look carefully, you'd see two more going back the lane to the chicken house back there. Oh, I see. Collecting. Collecting chickens. Eggs, not chickens. Oh, eggs. Take chick they just take eggs. And how many, how, how long would they stay when they break, bring up camp? Just long enough to talk to you and thank you and go on. I mean, in terms of the, um, the camp, how long would they camp out there? Oh, all summer? No, no. They, they stay there maybe for three, four weeks and then move on. Mm -hmm. And I can remember they were still doing that when they were driving automobiles. Is that right? Yeah, when mm -hmm. they were still driving, oh, that, I don't know how long a period of time that would have been. It would have been well into the 30s. But they would be, they'd come through just like they had done with horse and wagon, but with automobiles. Mm -hmm. And stop back there, camp, set up their camp, and kind of visit the neighborhood Visit again. the neighborhoods, right. Yeah. I remember a lot of the stories about the gypsies in the early 30s yeah. and what they would do. and. I, we affectionately called that Gypsy Lane. I, did, I didn't, even know, didn't even know what a gypsy was at that time, probably, except what you know, the old farmers around my neighborhood might have told me. And frankly, I was somewhat abashed when I heard that they had changed it to Hartman Road, <laughs> yes. because I think Gypsy Lane had a nicer ring it to it. It took a lot of history away. It took a lot of history away. Now, <clears throat> you were mentioning the farm on the, um, <clears throat> that would be on the southeast <clears throat> corner of Broad and Hartman right now. That was the Freed Farm. Right. Um, which Freed lived there? Do you remember? Well. <laughs> was that Corwin's Freed? It was Corwin's dad. Corwin's dad lived there. That's where he lived. And uh, I can remember <laughs> one of the stories that the whole neighborhood had that the barn burned down, an old barn that they had. Mm -hmm. And it was insured, and they got the money to build the new barn. I see. But Corwin lived in the little house on down the road. Mm -hmm. Past the big White House, right, mm -hmm. and he he lived there for quite a good many years. Yes, he died there, right yes, in the right. house. As a matter of fact, that's right. Corbin died um, when he was about 94, 95 years yeah. old. Um, the um, house right next to it belonged to the Gillespies. Does that ring a bell to you? I don't know that it belonged to them. But they lived there. Yes. You remember the Gillespies? Yes. I didn't know them. I was just a little kid. But they, that's where the Gillespies lived. Yes. That house still stands, does it now? Right. As a matter of fact, I think that some of the people who have the Hastings printing live in that Gillespie house now. Uh -huh. Now, what was where the where the uh, root beer stand is right now? What was well, there? Well, let's, uh, let's begin with Wadsworth and move out. Okay, we'll start with Wadsworth uh -huh. and move out. As you move out Broad Street, came up the hill, Bert Baird owned a, f a small farm on the north side of, of Broad Street. And that's where Overlook School is now, right? They, that's, that's not out to Overlook School. Oh, not yet. there yet, okay. This was where the old stone quarry was as you came up the hill. Okay, this is on Baird Street, perhaps? Just about Baird. Baird Street is just at the end of it, yes. And Bert Baird owned that farm. He owned that farm. And right. there's a stone quarry there. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you move on out and you come to the... To the, to the uh, Keller Farm. Keller Farm. Pete Keller. Pete Keller. And then the Fiscus Farm. The and Fiscus then, Farm was where? Next to east of the Keller Farm. Was that where uh, Dr. McCandless's house is now? Uh, just about. Just about. Just about, mm -hmm. yes. Probably very close to where High Point is now. Just about. Where that. High Point intersects Broad Street. That's okay. right. Mm -hmm. And then you move on out to the... To the uh, Kuntz Farm. The Kuntz Farm where Grace, Grace Goose Kuntz. Hinkle. That's right. And her granddaughter lives there now. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. She just passed away. That's an interesting story. Tell us about Grace Kuntz and the when interesting she... story there. <coughs> and her mother. Well, 
I don't remember her mother. But she died, didn't she, at 103 or 4, something like 109. that? 109. 109, wow. When she was 43 or 44 years old, they didn't think she was going to live through the summer. My she kind of made it, though, didn't she? Yes, she did. <laughs> <laughs> they, my mother cooked meals for them, took them up to them. My sister went along and cleaned up the dishes. I was a kid of about, oh, maybe four or five years old. But they decided, they checked, and they found that her teeth were in bad condition. I see. They pulled all her teeth that summer when she was 40, mid-40s somewhere, I forget the exact year. And she's lived in to 109. 109. Now, I saw something in the paper just the other day that said that um, a lot of diseases can be traced to teeth and gums and right, so forth. Right. Um, that was just an accident, probably, but it certainly did help her out a great deal. No, and they then, didn't think she would live through the summer. But she made it. Then she had a, a, um, um, a daughter, Marion. That's right. Marion Hinkle. That's right. And now tell us about Marion. I think she was a school teacher all of her life, wasn't she? She taught for a good many years, yes. And uh, she uh, and she had a brother, Roland. Roland Hinkle. Uh, Roland um, Coons. Coons, right. He had a, uh, a well, he, he delivered gravel and sand to the whole area. I see. He had a, uh, he had his little farm out on the road that used to go up to Medina, the diagonal road to Medina. 57 now? 57, or yes. Wadsworth Road? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Did the, um, uh, in the, in the Hinkle Farm then, just east of the Hinkle Farm was the um, Freed Farm then? East of the Hinkle Farm, yeah. yes, the Freed Farm, yes. And then beyond that, was the Mills Farm. Mills Farm. Mm -hmm. And didn't, uh, didn't a uh, coal mine <coughs> somewhat empty into the Mills Farm? Well, there were coal mines in this whole area. The whole area. In, in those days. On that side of the road, there was, a, there was a coal mine down. As you go down the hill in the Western Star, on the north side is the house of the little white pillars. Right. Mm -hmm. And in the back end of that was a big coal mine. There was a coal mine there. Yes. Now we're talking, <coughs> we're up to Western Star now. There's a lot of history in Western Star that we s simply don't know. And since it, it was at one time part of Wadsworth? No. No. Tell us about Western Star. Well, <laughs> Western Star at one time had three stores. Three stores. Yeah. And uh, it was the center of things, uh, the whole area at that time. In other words, we, the Wadsworth downtown wasn't there. It, wa it wasn't there. We went to Western Star for our stores and all That's of that. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then as I've as I said a while back, th I think it was four men got together. They heard that the Erie Railroad was coming through, and they were going to build a station in Western Star. Which would have been down on the Medina County Line Road, about right. a mile south of That's right. and uh, Western Star. These men got, uh, I think it was $500 they got together, and gave the Erie Railroad the $500 to build the station in Wadsworth rather than Western Star. Ah, money talks. So they yeah. built the station in Wadsworth at the south end of Wadsworth. It's no longer there, is it? Oh, yes. The station is there. Oh, the station isn't there, no. Yeah. no. The railroad track is there. And the track is yeah. there, but that was Wadsworth then. Right, it was Wadsworth. Yeah. Then what happened to Western Star as a result of the station well, being just, built? It lost uh, eventually a couple of the stores and finally ended up with one store. The store is still standing on the southeast corner. Oh, oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah the that, store in the southeast corner. That was corner. the last store. The family had that. and uh, Which family was it? Do you know who it was? Yes, I'll think of it sometime. <laughs> oh, I remember. They had a son who built a nice house on the north side of the road. Just Simmons? Like, no. No. No, it was not Simmons. Ah, oh, can't think of it. No. Himmelwright? That's it. Himmelwright. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the old the father had the had the grocery store there, and oh, it was not too many years ago till it finally closed as a store, and now it's a, well, I don't know, they've got all kinds of stuff piled in that place now. Some years ago, as a matter of fact, about 35, 40 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, there was the um, blue, what, blue, uh, there was a nightclub down there, the blue something, Forgotten the name of it right now. I can't think of that. And, and then it came to the Chicken Inn or the a Chicken Place. Yes. 
and then they tore it down. Yeah. And it's still, you know, the, the remnants are still there. Yeah. And then right next uh, across on the northwest corner, there's that auto place, that small yes. auto place, and that probably was a store then too, is that right? It, uh, not while I can remember, but it was one of the three stores in Western Star at one time. It was? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, well that, yeah. that means we had three stores down there. Now as you remember, since the Wadsworth stores didn't start building up until the Western Star stores uh, went uh, um, under because of the railroad station and so forth, what who, what were the stores that you remember in downtown Wadsworth when you were growing up? Well, I worked in one of them from the eighth grade on. Which one was that? Cal Irish Shoe Store on the east side. Cal Irish Shoe Store, which turned out to be what, Miller Jones or Ladrick's then? Well, it was, it became, it was then, there were three stores uh, fronts on the southeast corner of the square. Southeast corner of the square. Today, there, at that time, there was a a sandwich place, Clyde Anderton sandwich place on the alley. Clyde Anderson. Anderton. 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 A N D E R T O N. Yeah. Place. Then the shoe store, and then what was what changed hands? It was once the post office. The post office was where? Right on the southeast corner. On the, the right first, on the corner. The first business place. Okay, which when then was Nielsen's Jewelry and. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. The uh, post office also was down. Um, where the B and B store used to be, which is now uh, oh, I can't think of the name of the store that's there right now, but it was uh, from Mill Street up two stores. That's right. The oh, post on office the west was, side. On the west side, there's a post office. Well, was there, there was also a time when the post office was on the east side down there. Where? For a short time, on the east side of the of the of the square, but almost across from the place you're talking about. Okay, probably down where it was, the... Um, it was there for only a very short very time. Very short time. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> there were three shoe stores, did you say, right there, or just that one? Well... The Irish. Uh, Gal Irie, I-R-E-R-Y. Oh, I-R-E-R-Y, and his yeah. first name was Gal? Cal. Cal. Calvin, I think. Calvin Irie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was a son-in-law of Durling, who had the bank on the south west corner of the square. Which was now, which had been the Citizens which Bank? Which had been the Citizens and Bank. And what Durling was this? Was this J.K. Durling? Yes. And then his son was uh, Dr. Durling? Yeah. Okay. J.K. Durling had the bank. Yeah. And what? his daughter was married to Cal Irie. And his daughter was married to Cal Irie. Right. Okay. And then Cal Irie had the store on the opposite corner. Oh, not on the corner, in the, in the middle of those oh, in the three, middle of the two. Of those three business okay. places there. Yeah. Okay, fine. And then what was down the street on the east side of, um, as you remember? Well, there was uh, a clothing store, a men's clothing store, and then you had to go up about five steps to get into another drug store and candy store. You remember the names of these? Uh, Trying to think of the name of the fellow who had that, I can't remember it now. Mm -hmm. At one time, that was a G&H drugstore, but, uh, and... Um, that was, but what I'm talking about was... Way, way back. Way ahead of that. Yeah, way yeah. ahead. Mm -hmm. And then on down, there was a, a meat market, the gross meat market. Gross meat market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was on down there. And then beyond that, I'm trying to think of the name of the, the woman who ran a candy store right on the corner. That would not have been Miss Leatherman, was it? Was no, it? no, no, and I can't think of her name now either. And then you got to the school building, yeah. which that building still standing. I went through all 12 grades there. You went through all 12 grades there. Yeah. That building was built, you, it was probably new, somewhat new, was it oh, not? Oh, yes, yes. What, um, that, what, I think that was built in about 19, what, five, six, seven? I would say yes. And then you were- It was were, built about the time I was born, which was 1906. 1906. Yeah. So it was built then, and you went there six years later, so you went through the whole thing. Yeah. Who was the superintendent at the time? Do you remember? Well, there were three of them that I can think of. The one who was most well known in this area was a man by the name of Elliot. Mr. Elliot. Yeah, and he, he, from, he left here then and went to uh, uh, Mount Vernon, I believe. Mount Vernon. Do you remember Mr. Elliot's first name? Uh, <laughs> all I can remember. No, I don't. Well, as a child, you probably call him Mr. all the time. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and then who was the other superintendent? A fellow by the name of Kreider. Kreider. 
he, uh, his family home was up on High Street just beyond the uh, Trinity United Church of Christ there. Okay. And, uh, and a fellow by the name of Swearingen was the principal for a while in a very short time, very short period, was recognized as a superintendent. Then he moved to California. And uh, as we get on up into the, into the more recent age, I'm not as familiar with that because I was in Barberton all yeah, the time. Yeah, so you were teaching in Barberton then. Yeah. When did you begin teaching in Barberton? 28. In 1928. Wow, that's a long time ago. That's a long time ago. It's almost <laughs> 70 years ago. Yeah. And when did you quit uh, teaching in Barberton? 65. 65, so you're there for a good long time. Now, going on the west side of uh, was on the of, of Main Street, uh, can you remember the stores and who? Well, they changed a lot over yeah. the years. Mm -hmm. The one that stands out in my mind is the drugstore, which was across the street. And uh, a fellow by the name of Baker. Baker. And uh, he had that store for a number of years. He had a brother a year or two young, two years younger than he, Les Baker, who was quite a good, well, both of them were real good athletes in town. Mm -hmm. But I remember Les Baker especially. And he, I remember him especially because he got a basketball team started at what is now Trinity Church. And as a kid in the eighth grade, I played for, with that basketball team. And he was a he then he went to Heidelberg for a couple of years, came back and went to work for B&W and worked there until he retired. That's Les Baker. Les Baker. Yeah. Now, didn't Les Baker have some kind of a city position at one time? Well, not an elected position. No, I mean, didn't he work? Didn't he work in the light department or the? I think he did for yeah. a while. Yes. Yes, I can somewhat remember him in, in that uh, that area. Tell us about the police force in Wadsworth when you were growing up. What was it like? Well. Tommy Lucas. Tommy Lucas was it, huh? <laughs> and when did he start? Was he all the, all the years that you were growing up? When I up? was a kid growing up, he was the police force. Well, when I was a kid growing he up, was he was the attendance the, officer in the police force. The attendance officer for, for the, the schools. schools. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And how did he function? I mean, uh, do you think that he had uh, to read the Miranda rights to people and all of that <laughs> kind of thing? <laughs> he just rode his motorcycle all around the area. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He had a lot of power, didn't he? Oh, yes. He was recognized and, and, and respected. Oh, yes, very much so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, he went to, um, he became a mayor for a while, didn't he? Yes, a short yeah. time. Sure, for a short time, he became mayor. However, during the time that he was a chief of police and the only policeman, or the marshal, which was it? Marshal. It was the marshal. When did we start having policemen in Wadsworth? Do you remember? I can't tell you. Now, do you remember some of the early policemen? I can remember Ed Transu and Harv yeah. Welding. Well, those are two that came to mind for me. Uh, in fact, I think it was Transu who was first. And uh, they were the police force, and they were not as well known as Tommy Lucas had been. Yeah. Consequently, were, I shouldn't say they were not respected, but they just weren't recognized mm -hmm. as Tommy had been. Because he was the the law in Wadsworth, and people respected him. Oh, yes, he was the law. Yeah. Now, we go to, from the police and so forth, but <clears throat> which, which, who is the first mayor you remember? And could you tell us about the city offices at that time? Well, the first mayor, his home was down two houses south of Mill Street on the west, on the west side of, uh, I, I think of our, you know, Wadsworth is a peculiar town. There is no north and south. The town, where the streets we're talking about in the city of Wadsworth are either east or west or north or south, but they only went from the square Upper south north or, or the square north. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> this was on uh, Main Street then. Main Street then, just about three, four houses from Mill Street. And I'm trying to think of the guy's name, but he was a pleasant guy and a round face. I can see him, but I can't think of, recall his name now. Wouldn't be Durhammer, would it? No, mm -hmm. no. No. Well, it'll come to you, and maybe you can bring that up. Then who are some of the other mayors that you remember? Well, uh, as I said, the uh, <laughs> which one to pick out, I don't know. But I, I can't get, get all the names pulled out. Mm -hmm. But uh, the mayor that was, to me, the who did a, a good job for Wadsworth, of course, 
Wadsworth has, in the more recent years, a mayor has been a figurehead. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the early ones, this, this one I'm thinking about who lived just south of, uh, of uh, Mill Street there was the one who was really a mayor and ran the city pretty and very in a very good manner. He was well respected. But the situation in later years changed a lot when we finally got a city manager who has really run the city for, mm -hmm. for quite a few years. Yeah. What about um, as we look at uh, city council and so forth, we think of the city utilities. Do you remember getting electricity in Wadsworth? Yes. And you did not have electricity when you were born? Oh, no. And when did you first get electricity? And tell us all about it and what it was like and all of that. Well, you know, as far as the city is concerned, uh, the thing I remember most, out as you go out Broad Street, the city buildings and offices were on the south side. And the big round water tank there. Right. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, we would, I would walk home. On the way home, I'd walk up the little mound up to this water tank wall and see goldfish swimming around in the, in the pond. Oh, the tank was open? Oh, yes. Oh, my. <coughs> now, would they, would the, did they fill it up with, with pumps or what? Yeah, they were the, from deep wells. And then they distributed it. Yeah. And goldfish would be fish or would oh, be yeah. swimming around in there. Oh, yeah. Well, did they put them in there or they just... Somebody dropped them in probably. And they... They, they flourished. They flourished, I guess they would. <laughs> um, when, when did you get electricity and what, what was it like? I can't remember when the first electricity was, was produced in Wadsworth, but the, the source of, of electricity to begin with was the old uh, trolley line. The that goes through Silver Creek. Silver and the Creek's, south end of Wadsworth, yeah. and then came up into the center of Wadsworth. Yeah, it never was to the south end of Wadsworth. It came into East Street. Bro came into Broad Street, oh. right? We're almost be just beyond where East Street right. turns south. But I can remember when that happened, that whole thing was happening, and uh, the town was quite excited. <laughs> about the electricity. Oh, yes. Now, did and, you about the tr and about the old streetcar. Streetcar. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get to the streetcar line here in a couple of minutes, but what about the electricity? When, when they first got it, did you have lights in every room, or did you have just one light, or did you well, have a lot of lights? I was born didn't have electricity any time while we lived there. Never? Never. When was the first time that you remember turning a light switch on and the light came on above? <laughs> well, I suppose that was when we moved into town from out there when I was in the eight, or, well, when we moved into town, I was a junior in high school. And where did you live here in town when you were a junior? Well, we, uh, we moved to Boyer Street. Boyer Street. And then uh, they, the family moved from there to the northwest corner of Boyer and Highland. And then uh, when I got married, we bought up on Porty, or on uh, Prospe Prospect. On Prospect? <laughs> no, no, no. Crestwood. Crestwood, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We bought up there in 1940. 1940. And you remember then when you moved to town, were the lights already in, or did they bring them oh, in? Yes. Oh, the yes. The electricity was already oh, in? Oh, yes. Yeah. And what was the feeling that you had when you first turned on a light and you saw a light burn <laughs> like that? Of course, if we had not been visiting and knowing a lot of people who already had it, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have been quite the same experience as just doing what other people were doing. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't an uncommon thing, of course, by that time. But where we had lived out in the country, there was no electricity in that house. Yeah. Do you remember seeing your first light bulb? No. <laughs> you don't remember that? You I can't. remember turning your first switch on or something no, like that? No. Tell us about the trolley car. I mean, the street car, as we called it. Uh, what, what did it do, and where did it go, and how much did it cost? Well, it came from Akron down through Bar Kenmore, Barberton to Wadsworth, and north out of Akron to Cahoga Falls, and there was a connection that you could ride a street car clear up to Cleveland. To Cleveland? And then out the west out of Cleveland, out towards Sandusky. Wow, you could go to the streetcar the whole yeah. way then. And I can remember our on a Sunday afternoon taking a picnic, picnic basket with us, and riding the streetcar through Barberton, through Akron, up to Silver Lake to have a picnic up at Silver Lake. Wow. 
when I was a little kid. I can remember I was packing a basket and going up there for a picnic on Sunday. Now, what would that have cost to go from here to Silver Lake? Well, would, I think the, fee, the I think the uh, fare to Akron from Wadsworth, I think, was 20 cents. 20 cents? I think that's what it was, yeah. Now, do you remember how much it was to Barberton? Did you ever take the streetcar to Barberton? 10 cents. Oh, 10 yeah. cents to Barberton. Yeah. Did you ever take the streetcar to Barberton? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where would you pick it up? The, the streetcar came into Broad Street, uh, as we said a bit ago, uh, just beyond where the post office was. The post office, the post office building is really still there. Yes. Well, the streetcar came into Broad Street just east of the, of the post office. Right where the Young House used to be. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I went on into town, out college, to the end of the park, which is no longer there and then backed up into the High Street station, you call it a station, it's where it waited, there was no building or right. anything. Right, they backed into that. <coughs> yeah, but and then, then ran out, back Then out they would go back out the same track. Yeah. Now, um, did they go very fast? We don't think of streetcars as going very fast, but... Um, I don't know what the speed would be, I don't think it'd be over 25 miles an 25 hour. 25 miles an hour, but a lot of people would ride the streetcar oh, with yes. it. Mm -hmm. People who, people who worked in Barberton and Akron, a lot of them work, rode that every day. Now, how many, um, uh, how, when, what, what time in the morning would it start and when would it end? Do you remember? Well, this, the, the t early years of the streetcar, it, it came, as I remember, it came about every two hours in the early years of the streetcar. Well, as time went on, few and few and few people used the streetcar. They had automobiles and didn't need to use it. And they, Eventually, if there was one or two people riding the streetcar, that was it. <laughs> I see. Now, there used to be a, a streetcar stop in Silver Creek. Oh, yes. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yes. There was and one, there was one uh, at Silver Creek, and then there was one... Uh, in Sherman. In Sherman, and one on the way on the west side of Barberton. And then it had, went up uh, down through the main part of Barberton and headed north on Old High Street there and up into Akron, and then the, the main traction uh, garage, you'd call it, really, was, uh, was beyond the north end of Barberton and into, into Kenmore, and on the south side of, the, of what had been the tracks and the, road, and the street there is where they did the repair work for the streetcars. Well, they called that the car barns, didn't they? That's right. The car barns. Uh, somewhere around... Um um, Kenmore Boulevard and Manchester Road, somewhere in that area, wasn't that? I think it was a little bit east of that. East of that, right. Remember the car barns over there. Um, <clears throat> we talked about the trains and we talked about the, the streetcars. Do you remember your feeling when you first started seeing automobiles? In 1906, there weren't that many automobiles. Very few. Now, wh what did you remember about the automobiles and uh, the excitement of them and who had them and so forth. Who had the first cars around well, here? I remember they always tried to test the new automobile out on Acme Hill. On Acme Hill because yeah. it's a, someone told me one time that that's one of the one of the highest hills in Ohio or is it Broad Street? Broad Street? No, off the back end of the farm where we are right here. Yes. Back there in the little bit of woods that is left is the second highest spot in the state. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And Mount Vernon is what, the highest? Is that no, it? No. No, where? It's not, no, it's, it's on west and south of Mount Vernon. South of Mount Vernon. Uh, I can't think of the name of the little town, but that's the highest spot in the state. South and the, so tell us exactly where the second <coughs> highest spot is here in... Well, the, right here where we are. We're in the high in school the, right now. In this now. building, mm -hmm. on this farm, back south and, and east of the high school building, there's a little bit of wood stuff yes, back right. here. That is supposed to be the second highest spot in the state. In other words, that's where that <coughs> new allotment is, um, Wintergreen, yeah. somewhere close to there. Wintergreen is the second yeah. highest spot in Ohio, is that right? right. Uh, well, that's, that's really interesting there. <coughs> now, tell us about the cars. When you were, who, who had them in Wadsworth? Do you remember any? <laughs> well, uh, a fellow in the name of Gross, the, the Gross Meat Market, they had one of the first cars. Gross Meat Market had one. What kind one, did he have? Do you remember? I don't remember. What did it look like? Well, it, had, it was an open five-passenger car. Open five-passenger. Yeah. It had a top that you could put down. Mm -hmm. And uh, what its speed was, I have no idea. <laughs> Probably not very fast. No, no. Noisy? Very. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And then when was the first time that you rode in a car? Do you remember that? Well, the first, uh, the first real long ride I had, or what I thought was a long ride, was that was a Sunday that we packed up at lunch and followed, took the streetcar into Akron and on up to Silver Lake for a picnic on a Sunday afternoon. No, I mean in, a, in a, an automobile. Oh, in an automobile. Yeah, the first time that you were at, we're, we're in an automobile, that you rode in an automobile. I'm trying to think what would have been the first automobile ride. I remember riding out to Acme Hill, and I can't think who was driving the car. What was your feeling, <coughs> riding in something that had never been part of anybody's experience before? Well, you had certain trepidation about what was going to happen mm -hmm. riding in that noisy thing. <laughs> the, um, obviously, the, the, the ride wasn't particularly smooth, oh. but was it exciting knowing that you were... Well, yes, there was a certain excitement to it and a certain feeling of exhilaration that you were doing things now that had never been done Never had before. been done before. Yeah. Uh, do you remember going to Wadsworth, for instance, in horse and buggy? Oh, yes. You do? Yes. And uh, where would you, well, how would you go to town? Who would drive the, you wouldn't be permitted to drive the... I remember riding a horse and buggy to Worcester from this farm right here. Right here where we're to sitting. To get my first store-bought suit of clothes. And what year would that have been? 1966. Would have been about 1912 or 13. 1912 or 13. Yeah. Do you remember how long it took you to get to Worcester from here? I know we left in the morning and came back that night. You came back the same night? Yeah. And my that's 20. My, brother, my mother drove the horse. Your mother drove the horse? Yeah. Yeah. And one horse, obviously. Right. And you went some 25 miles. Yeah. And then came back 25 miles on the same day, and you probably thought that was something extraordinary. It was. <laughs> now we go to Columbus and come back on the same yeah. day. Sometimes people go, you know, halfway around the world and come back the same day with an airplane. That's right. One of the questions that people always have from people like you is, what has been your feeling about the various changes that you have seen from the time that you were born? Um, what were the, I, I, I'll give you an example. I can remember in 1947, <coughs> I had never seen television before. Mm -hmm. And it was the spring of the year or the fall of the year. I know it was nice weather, like probably the fall of the year. And um, the Curtis Electric had a television set in the window. And this was during our lunch hour from oh, the I'm high school. Trying, you're talking, this was Bill Curtis. Bill Curtis, yes. Yeah. Not, not Dick Curtis, the yeah. clothing person, yeah. but Bill Curtis had a television set, and we would go up there during the lunch hour. I mean, we, that was the, the, the best pacifier for, yeah. for errant students in the world. Of course, we were not errant students, but we, were, um, we could have got into some trouble. Of course, people didn't get into trouble so much then as they do now, but we went up there, and we would all stand around in a semicircle and watch some very inane little something or another. And I can remember thinking to myself that I was almost frightened to think that we had, had um, proceeded this far, that we had gone this far in uh, technology, that we could watch somebody the, way over there, way over there yeah. and on television. And it was just a, a, so, now that was just one of the things. I remember my first radio and thinking to myself that um, I wonder where these people sleep at night because they probably are inside the radio and they are probably very, very small and I had no idea how radio worked. And I can still remember that. Now, you have so many other things. Just as an example, the electric light, the uh, automobile, and certainly the airplane. Now, how did you feel when you saw your first airplane fly overhead, for instance? Well, Do you remember that? I remember a, a good friend flying into town, landing out here on the, at the end of what used to be the orchard, and taking people up for a ride. Do you remember who? Do you remember who he was? He, he was he was born on the corner of Highland Avenue, and Broad Street on the on the west corner. There. On the west corner. On the west corner. Do you remember his name, Carl? I'll think of it. Uh, he had two twin. He had twin brothers, and a sister, and another brother. Uh, huh, I'll think of it. Well, when we come to that, we can. Yeah. And what did you think of that airplane? What, did you, what, what was it like? Well, it was a plain old two-wing, uh, 
I can remember the motor and the noise it made. Oh boy, I'll bet. <laughs> yeah, when it took off. But he came into town and spent oh, several days here with his family and took people up for rides. Do you re did you ride with him? No. No. Do you remember what year that would have been? Well, it would have to be, I was not through school here yet. I can't think for exactly what year it might have been, but it probably would be in the... In the 1916, uh, 17, somewhere in there. It would be pretty close to 20. Pretty close to 20? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, right now there's not a kid alive who, takes, who does not take for granted the fact that overhead there are all kinds of airplanes. When they started flying overhead, what feeling did you have? Well, <laughs> you wondered what it's like up there looking down. You know, the, 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 going farther with your question, I wonder how many people saw this series of three programs here not too long ago on Monday nights, 8 o'clock, did you happen to see any of No, that? I didn't. I can't. I rarely watch television. That's, it was an amazing experience, explaining as we reach out farther and farther and farther, is there an end? To the end. Yes. Yeah. It was, it was an amazing experience for me. I watched the last program twice. But it's the same sort of thing you're, you're asking about as far as the airplane's concerned. As we develop more and more technique to reach out farther and farther, is there an end or is there no end? There is no end at all, yeah. right. There's an old saying that says something like, um, um, if it, infinity is a real bummer for those people who, who want closure. Yeah. Because <laughs> there is no closure, probably. Well, that, you know, that's, that's an interesting concept. Do you remember anything else new? I mean, what invention really took you by storm? I can tell you which one mine was, you know. Um, people think today that everything that we have today was certainly here, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years ago. The invention which took me by storm, as far as I was concerned, was the watch that you didn't have to wind. Yeah. Now, isn't that something? It's just a yeah. dumb little thing, but that was one of the things. What invention took you by storm and when? Well, and incidentally, this was way back in the 40s, but they watched it after our 50s, I believe. I think it would, have, it would have to be, as far as my thinking was concerned, radio. The radio. Where is it coming from? Right. Yeah. Radio. And people can't possibly fathom of that today no. that, you know, we did not have radio. Yeah. And radio was something that was... Um, a real novelty. As a matter of fact, it was one of those scary things. How yeah. far are we going to go out into yeah. to, to the unknown? Carl, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you're very interesting, and certainly uh, we need to know a lot about you as well as about what you remember. Uh, your career, you, uh, you have had a career in teaching for, well, 35, 40, 50 years, something like that. Uh, tell us about that and what you did. Well, <laughs> I... Uh... I can remember going back to the, the the shoe store built. My first job was as an eighth grader in Cal Irie's shoe store. And there, of course, I met a lot of people. And among those people I met was Les Baker, who I've mentioned before. Right, Les Baker. Who worked there in the shoe store at the same time I did. And also, I must remember, a gal who taught in Wadsworth, taught math, one of the best math teachers Wadsworth ever had, her name was Swigert. Phyllis Swigert? No. Irma Swigert. Irma Swigert, okay. <clears throat> no. mm -hmm. But she is the one who got me interested in going on to school. And working in the shoe store, a fellow started there, oh, two years after I did, and we worked together there. We were in the same high school class. And he wanted me to, at the end of our high school, graduating, wanted me to go in with him and buy the shoe store. And I'm thankful that I didn't. I'm sure you are. Because he... Uh, he got another fellow to go in with him and fleeced him blind. Is that right? Oh, I'm glad what, I missed that. What year did you graduate from high school? 24. 1924. Now, who were some of the teachers in the high school when you were there? <clears throat> well, this Irma Swigert was probably the best one. She was a math teacher. She was a math teacher and a good one. And she did a lot for a lot of kids. And uh, she 
Well, in my case, I, I give her credit. I don't blame her. I give her credit for getting me on to school. And uh, at, at Heidelberg, I just followed the usual course, played a little basketball, and I ruined a knee and a few things like that. But uh, she was responsible for my getting on to school. And uh, Who was your English teacher, for instance, in the high school? Well, I had two or three of them over the years, different ones. Do you remember the names? I don't remember the names, and I don't remember much about them. I wasn't too impressed. You weren't too impressed with them. <laughs> How about, uh, what are the courses that you have to take then? You have to take history. Who was your history teacher? Well, I had uh, two good history teachers. One, uh, oh shoot. One, there was another one, a history teacher, who was also a minister in town and was not a very good disciplinarian. Ah. I can remember a fight on the, <laughs> the big old study hall up on the second floor yeah, there. Yeah, 301. Yeah. I remember a fight between he and another fellow. <laughs> no, the uh, going on into college and back out again, and uh, my college coach, Sager, had grown up in a, in a Fort Wayne orphan's home and uh, graduated there and then came on to Heidelberg. And from Heidelberg, he came into the Akron area. He coached and taught in Barberton and up in Akron. And uh, it was through him that I uh, started in where I did in Barberton when I graduated from uh, college that the superintendent knew about the background of both of us and I had no problem getting a job. Do you remember who the superintendent was when you first started in Barberton? U.L. Light. U.L. Light. And there's a school named after him right now. Right. Yeah. And then did you have any other superintendents that you remember in Barberton? Well, there were a succession of them. They didn't average more than three, four years apiece. How about principals? Uh, had a couple that I could remember, but for the most part, uh, I was coaching, teaching. When I first started over there, I had my first year in Barberton, I had five different classes and was helping with both football and basketball. You had five preparations. Five preparations. And you had helping with football. And basketball. And basketball. Yeah. And just out of curiosity, what was your salary for doing all of that? $1,400 when I started. $1,400. And three years later, it was less than thirteen. Why was that? That was during the period of the Depression. Depression. It went but, down to thirteen. But you know the interesting thing about Barbert, we never, we never got paid in script. Akron got paid in script for a couple of years. We never did. We got money. Tell us about script. I'm sure that's a concept that people don't recognize anymore. Well, you just got pieces of paper which were acceptable in your community. The stores had to accept that. If they were going to sell anything, that was the only way they could sell it. And they, they passed the script along and the banks accepted it for a period of, I guess, well, probably three, four years. Would it be less than your normal salary if they paid you in script, no, or would it be the regular? you're supposed to be on the same salary schedule, but be getting script instead of cash. How long did you have to take a cut in salary during that time? It that was about, uh, I would say it must have been four years till we got through that period and then got into a, a more normal situation of taxation, providing funds to carry on a normal business. Normal period. business. What was the, the Depression like in Wadsworth? What was happening in Wadsworth at that time, during the 30s, 29, from 1929 to 1940, 41? Well, I wasn't too familiar with Wadsworth in those years. I see. I was in Barberton, in Barberton. All, all day long. And uh, actually, I, I'm ashamed to say I wasn't too familiar with Wadsworth. Mm -hmm. But you were living in Wadsworth, though. Living here, yeah. went to church here, had uh, a lot of good friends here, but was not too aware of what was actually happening downtown with families. Right. Now, this meant that you were getting about $100 a month or so uh, over a year's period. What could you buy with $100 a month at that time? Well, <laughs> we bought what we needed. Mm -hmm. I can remember sitting with Billy in the kitchen. The Your wife, year, Billy. My mm -hmm. wife, Billy, sitting in the kitchen talking to her about we were in Clover. We were going to be getting $200 a month next year. Wow. <laughs> but the, when you went to the grocery store, what would it cost? Well, <laughs> the, the, the whole thing that you're talking about, to me, 
is just living with the change in the whole economy. If you didn't make much, you didn't have to pay much. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing balanced out. We never, uh, as far as we were concerned, we always had, of course, we were living on a farm. We had no money, but we had enough yeah, to eat. Yeah, food, right. Mm -hmm. We had enough to eat. And that's the only thing that really has stuck with me over all these years. I knew we had no money except that I earned a little bit of money, of course, working at the shoe store. My first job there opened on working just on Saturdays. We opened at 7 in the morning, closed at 11 at night for a dollar a Saturday. A dollar a Saturday? Yeah. For the whole day? Yeah. Now, in 1945, I got a job in a store in Wadsworth, the B&B store. Yeah. And I would work 40 hours a week, and I would get $25 a week. Oh, and yes. And then they would take taxes out, so I got $23 clear, $23 yeah. and a few cents clear. Yeah. Then I went to work at the injector. Yeah. In 1948, before I went, to, went away to school, and I would make 85 cents an hour, and the following year, I came back and I thought that I was going I was just absolutely in heaven because I went, went across the street to the match shop in the summertime and I made a dollar and seven cents an hour. And I thought that was outstanding. As a matter of fact, I didn't know what I could do with all that money, I thought. <laughs> and all day long, I was a mule. What um, They would load um, these match boxes onto a cart, and I would push them to the place where someone yeah. would take them off. That's all day, all day long for a dollar and seven cents an hour. Right now, I just got, um, well, I'm just finishing a, 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 um, a short term with uh, one of the schools and uh, got, um, uh, helping kids with their uh, academics and so forth. And I got a, a letter from a McDonald's in Akron asking me to send them good representatives that they could hire it's McDonald's now for $10.47 an hour. Yeah. Of course, well, I don't know if they're still doing that, but they were just desperate at that time. <clears throat> so, you know, we, it's difficult. But then, you know, when you go to buy a candy bar now, what did you, what did you pay for a candy bar a when nickel. you were growing up? A nickel. Yeah. And it was a big candy bar, too, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Now you buy a candy bar, it's 50, 75 cents, oh, sometimes yes. a dollar, whatever. And what did you pay for a bottle of Coke? That was a nickel. Too. A nickel also. Now, 60, 70 cents, sometimes 75 cents. Well, you're so talking about hourly wage. When I, my job, the one summer, just before I went off to college, I worked at the injector for 35 cents an hour. 35 cents an hour. 35 cents an hour. And what hour did you do? Building valves. Well, I used to. valves. For 85 cents an hour, I would worked in the shipping department lifting <coughs> valves that weighed 160 pounds, and I would list those all day long for 85 cents an hour, yeah. and I thought that it was just wonderful because I was yeah. able to get enough money. Carl, you know, you've been extremely interesting, and you know, we'd love to continue this. Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of our, of our um, hour here. Uh, one of the things <coughs> I'd like to ask you as we close today, your entire career in Wadsworth has been one that has given you not only a wonderful living, wonderful, of course, in quotation marks and so forth, but it has also given you respect that very, very, very few people have. Now, there are probably were times that you, that you could have moved out of Wadsworth. Why did you stay in Wadsworth all these years? Just because you were born here? No, because of a job in Barber. And that was the, that was the reason? Yeah. No, I. I had chances to move on, college jobs, but the thing I liked about Barberton, <clears throat> my kids were predominantly second generation kids in this country. Their families had come from Central Europe, from all over Europe, settled over there, worked in the shops over there, and they were wonderful kids to work with. And uh, I had chances to move on to other schools, but I never wanted to leave over there. I enjoyed it. They, they wanted me to apply for the superintendency when UL Light retired. <coughs> Two of the board members came to me and wanted me to apply for it. I said, I will apply for it if I can have at least one or two classes. Yep, I know that feeling. Yeah. Well, we're <coughs> awfully glad that Barberton kept you here, and we're glad that you're part of Wadsworth, and we salute you, Carl Harter, and thank you for the Wadsworth Area Historical Society. Well, thank you for having me here. <laughs> <laughs>